Hello! Uh, we've got a lot to talk about today, so I'm going to go through this as quick as I can. I've said this before and it's always been a lie, but I'm gonna try this time. Uh, so, last week was a bit negative, the end of Alloy of Law, which I did not like. This week we are starting Words of Radiance, and two, two experiences could not be more different. I am, like, already this first little part of Words of Radiance uh, blows the Way of Kings out of the water, and the Way of Kings itself blew anything else Sanderson had written previously out of the water. Like, the Stormlight Archive is getting better at a rate that scares me. Because I don't know how it can get better from here. Uh, so, let's talk about this first part of, uh, of Words of Radiance. I'm going to actually make it through the actual chapters relatively quickly, because uh, I want to talk about one particular thing more than anything else. And I'm going to do that at the end. <clears throat> but before we get there, let's just make uh, go through some notes here. So... First of all, spoilers, by the way, uh, Yasna, whose name is pronounced Yasna, not Jasna, I've been told, um, which is actually quite interesting because that is how you would, that is a name in my language, Serbian, Yasna, like there, there are people named that in Serbia, and the fact that I saw that name and pronounced it in English, even though it's a, it's clearly a Slavic-inspired name, uh, Made me question some things about my assumptions, I guess. Uh, um, so yeah, Yasna. Yasna is 100% not dead. I guarantee this. There is not a single atom of my being that suspects for a moment that Yasna is actually dead, even though we literally saw her die. Um, and there are several reasons for that. One, she's clearly a really major character with a lot going on. This book starts with a prologue that hints at a really complex and interesting backstory for her. And since that isn't resolved by the time she dies, clearly she, we're going to get more Yasna. Um, likewise, she says that she has two powers, much like Shalon has two and Kaladin has two, although we still don't know what the two are with Kaladin. Um, but we only know of one of them, and it feels weird to have a character be like, oh yes, I have two powers, and then demonstrate one power and die. So, no, Yasna is not dead, I'm not buying it. Um, uh, when it... When it's inevitably revealed that she's still alive, I might be a little bit annoyed because I don't like fake-out deaths, but it's not my least favorite trope. Like, it's not one of those things that, like, immediately turns me off a story. Um, and this story is so good in every other respect that I'll forgive the obvious fake-out death here. Um, so... We're not going to talk about Yasna's death because it didn't happen. She's alive. Um, what else? Uh, Shalon has a new friend named Pattern. Uh, she has her own sill now. And Pattern is weirdly adorable. I was not expecting... Uh, based on the previous book, if you had told me that one of those symbol-headed creatures that was haunting Shalon's drawings would be cute? I don't know that I would have believed you, but somehow Sanderson pulls it off. Pattern is adorable. Um, I don't really have much else to say about Pattern because we haven't really... Uh, it hasn't really been developed as a character much yet beyond being adorable. Uh, but as for Shalon, we have uh, the second bit of confirmation here. It was actually confirmed in the previous book, but very subtly. But here we have the second, like, much more explicit bit of confirmation that Shalon 
does have a shard blade um, and has used it before. I think it's implied that she killed her own mother with it uh, in that one flashback. We still don't have any context for that. I'm guessing that this book is going to have a lot of Shallan flashbacks, like the previous one had Kaladin flashbacks. So I'm sure we'll find out soon enough what happened there. Um, but the main thing I'm curious about is how does Shallan have a shard blade? Because based on that flashback, it kind of seems like she had it as a little child. And as far as I know, there's like, like shard blades aren't something that manifests as like a, a magic power. You have to acquire an existing shard blade. So whose shard blade is, was this? Where did she get it? That's the main question I have going forward with Shallan, I think. Um, although obviously I have a lot of questions. Um... And Shallan continues to be the character I find myself relating to the most, even though, uh, even though I think that Kaladin is a, at this point, better developed character. Um, Kaladin doesn't really do much in this section. Uh, this, uh, Kaladin's portions of this, of, of this particular section of the book were not as interesting as Shallan's. Um, Kaladin's and Dalinar's, I mean. Um... But there's a lot of setup in those chapters for something that is clearly going to happen. And uh, Sanderson does something really interesting here because at the beginning of each chapter, there's like a little bit of text. Uh, and in this part of the book, that text is from Navani's journal, but it's Navani's journal from the future. And it's full of spoilers. <laughs> so going into this section of the book, we know that some sort of horrible tragedy is going to happen. And we also know, based on those journal entries, that the way it's going to happen is that some of the Parshmen are going to turn on the Alethi. Uh, and that's a bold choice, to basically tell us what's going to happen ahead of time and remove the suspense from that. But I think it works, because now... The suspense comes from the fact that I know that something horrible is coming and I have an idea of what it is, but none of the characters do. And that adds a different kind of suspense, which is, which is fun. It's nice to have a, a, a variety of types of emotions. And I feel like not a lot of authors would go for this particular combination uh, which makes it u feel unique, so I like that. Um, so, do I have anything else to say about... Uh, yes, I do actually have something else to say about the actual chapters here. Um, so, Sedeus. Sedeus gets a point of view chapter here. And Sedeus is an example of a type of villain that Sanderson does a lot. So... Generally speaking, when you're doing villains in stories like this, you're going to either have someone who is cartoonishly evil and and very one-dimensional and not very interesting to read about, like their internal life, but inter but maybe amusing to watch because they're over the top and ridiculous in their evil. Uh, so looking back at previous uh, Sanderson books, that would be a character like Ruin for example. Ruin very much falls into that category. Uh, there's no complexity, really, to Ruin, uh, but he is kind of fun to watch sometimes. And then you've got the other extreme, which is villains who have a, have a lot of uh, depth, and you, you're meant to kind of sympathize with them. They're not maybe even meant to be, like, straightforward villains. Uh, there's some com there's something morally complex or gray about them, and you're meant to see their point of view. Um, Sanderson has not been great at this kind of villain, historically. Uh, the, the the couple of times he's tried, you get things like, well, like Miles, and Miles is not great. Um, so I'm uh, not 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 a big fan uh, of, of of his uh, previous attempt at that. Although 
funnily enough, that is the kind of villain that this whole Cosmere thing started with um, in the form of Hrathen. Hrathen is very much a villain of that mold. Um, and he was a good one, but Sanderson hasn't really recaptured that particular spark yet. But what Sanderson does do very well is a kind of intermediate type of villain. So a villain who is not meant to be sympathetic, like they are 100% evil. You are not meant to be like, oh, they might have a point. Like, no, they're just evil. They're a bad person. But there is enough psychological complexity and unique concepts going on with how they are presented that you are still interested in seeing inside their head and reading about them. And this is something that Sanderson very clearly learned from Robert Jordan, because Robert Jordan has a lot of these villains. Robert Jordan's villains tend to be fairly one-dimensional in their motivations. They tend to just be, you know, evil for evil's sake. But they've got a lot of interesting stuff going on inside their heads regardless. Um, you're never going to sympathize with them. You're never going to question if they're the, really the bad guy. You're never going to be like, oh, I kind of wish this character would win. No, they're just straight up villains, but they're sort of fascinating to observe and get into the heads of. And that's something that Sanderson has always excelled at, in my opinion. Um, we had that with, uh, what's his name? Um... Ellen's dad, uh, Strath. Strath in uh, Well of Ascension, and Vane in Well of Ascension as well. Um, we had that, uh, we have that now with Sedeus, um, and I'm sure there's another one that I, I'm just not thinking of right now, but either way, that's just something that Sanderson is, is, is really good at, in my opinion. And, and I only realized that that was a, like a type of villain that he was doing while I was reading Sudeus's chapter because I kept getting these echoes of Strath while reading it. Sudeus is very different from Strath, but the vibe, the emotion you feel while reading his chapter is the same, which is, oh, this is an awful person, but like kind of a fascinatingly awful person. Like you want to, you want to, you want to read about them being awful, if that makes sense. Uh, like, it, it's, it's, no, it's not one-dimensional. It's a multi-dimensional character, and all of their dimensions are awful. <laughs> Which is kind of an interesting combination. Uh, so yeah, uh, I just wanted to say that Sedea seems really promising, as does his wife. His wife is also, I, I think a part of why he's interesting to me is the dynamic he has with his wife. Um, uh, another small thing I noticed is that, uh, Syl, when trying to imitate human women, one of the things she's noticed that human women do is that when they're frustrated, they pull their hair. That, to me, feels like another homage to Robert Jordan. Um, I, I, I it might not be, but it feels like it. Um... And what else? Uh, yeah, one thing I'm kind of wondering is, what's going to happen with Shen? Shen is a really weird character, because Shen has not been developed at all, and he's ne not really been focused on at all. He's kind of like this... He's, he's a character who the story wants us to forget about. And that makes me think that, sh that something really, really big is going to happen with Shen. Either he's going to turn on everyone, he's going to... Uh, sp spoilers for the part of this part of the book that I haven't talked yet I'll get to that but either he's going to turn out to not be a parchment at all and is actually a dull form which we'll get to or he is going to maybe become a Parshendi through his training with Kaladin maybe like ascend from his like Parchment, Parchment uh, state. Uh, either way, I feel like Shen is going to be a pivotal character going forward.
especially after what we learn about the Parshendi here. But before we get to the Parshendi, which is the thing that I really want to talk about, there are two other intermission chapters at the, uh, that are not the Parshendi at the end of this section. So we have one from the perspective of a shoemaker, and that one is just some world building and set up for later because he dies at the end, so that's not going to be a major character. But the world building there was fun, and I also like the fact that he is a radiant, or a potential radiant. Like, he has one of the radiant powers and a bond with a, with a spren. Um, and he's not a major character. He's never going to influence the plot. He was just some random guy, and he died. And I like that. I like that we are seeing that these powers are not being granted only to the chosen heroes of the narrative. Like, they're kind of being spread around at random. And sometimes it's just not going to work out. And this was one such example. Uh, so I like that. And the other chapter we get here is really cool. And that is the chapter from the perspective of Risen. Risen? 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 I'm not sure. R-Y-S-N. Anyway, Risen is the merchant's apprentice who we met in the last book. She actually had, I think, two uh, two intermission chapters, interlude chapters in the last book. Um, she's apprenticed to a Thalen merchant, I believe. Um, and here we see her exploring a very, very unique and interesting part of the setting, which is... Uh, the Reshi Isles, which are actually not islands at all, they're actually giant crustaceans that pe that are so huge that people live on them. Uh, like they're like they're the size of islands. Um, and the thing this chapter made me realize, well, first of all, it made me realize that Risen is not a one-off character. Risen is clearly going to be important, especially given how this chapter ends. I feel like. We're maybe eventually going to see Risen transition from the interlude chapters into the main plot, maybe? Um, and the other thing I found interesting here is the world building. The world building here is fantastic, and it's fantastic in a way which, and I'm sorry to keep bringing this up, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm trying not to, but this really made me think of it, it's, fan it's fantastic in a way which really makes me think of Robert Jordan and specifically makes me think of the fact that in a lot of ways, Stormlight Archive feels like the Wheel of Time but with the rough edges sanded off because the Wheel of Time has a lot of great stuff in it but it's also a deeply, deeply flawed work. Like, there's a lot that went wrong in my opinion, at least personally, with the Wheel of Time. And overall, it's still great, but a lot went wrong. And I feel like Stormlight Archive is doing a lot of the same things, especially in regards to the world building that the Wheel of Time was doing, but it's avoiding some of the mistakes that the Wheel of Time made. One of those mistakes was gender essentialism. Um, and... That is kind of rectified here with the Reshi. The Reshi... Now, I've actually been pretty critical of Brandon Sanderson so far, and in that I feel like a lot of the... Almost all of the societies we've seen in the Cosmere so far, despite having very, very different cultural norms and very different sort of everything and values, they do seem to have, like, fairly traditional uh, gender roles. Like, it's weird that... Women in Elantris, Mistborn, Warbreaker, and Stormlight are consistently, like, like the, it's consistently expected f that women wear dresses and men wear suits across these four completely different worlds. Uh, and I've commented on that before, and I'm actually writing, a, like, a little, a little, little paper on that right now, uh, like, the the weird, like, the weirdly consistent gender roles in the Cosmere. But this book kind of throws a wrench in the works for me there, because this book does two things already. First of all, it has the Reshi, who clearly have a very different conception of gender. 
here we have a person who is biologically female but who fulfills the societal role of a man specifically a king and is treated as a man is referred to with masculine pronouns and i find that really interesting i'm 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 intrigued by that uh and i'm hoping we get more of more stuff like that going forward more 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 explorations of alternative cultural and social models of gender um so that's the one thing i'm interested in, I'm, I'm interested in here and the other thing i'm interested in is what we find out about how gender works among the parshendi and now we get to the part i really want to talk about because nothing i've talked about so far matters at all i forced myself to talk about it because obviously it is important and it's all great but my brain is completely obsessed with the two parshendi chapters and nothing else right now because dear god i've never seen a like a single chapter recontextualize the entire story so much like the first parsh the first chapter from a show nice perspective did we suddenly understand so much about the parshendi we understand why they're always humming or singing in tune we understand uh the differences between parshman and parshendi we understand that they have different forms we understand their really seemingly completely gender gender egalitarian society uh where there aren't really differences between men and women even when it's like even biologically when they when they are in the same form they appear to have roughly equal abilities there's no indication that uh a woman in war form is any weaker than a man in war form um or a man in nimble form is any less agile than a woman in nimble form or whatever no there like gender doesn't seem to come into it which i which i'm really refreshed by um and it's also something robert jordan would have never done by the way uh um and but much more importantly than that the thing that fascinates me about the parshendi chapter is the uh the rhythms Th this idea that there are these rhythms that all exist in parallel overlapping each other in nature i guess is the implication and there are these rhythms that correspond to different emotions and only the parshendi can feel them and attune to them and sort of move and think and speak and sing in tune with a given rhythm at will that's so fascinating and i cannot wait to see that get developed and i have a feeling that it's going to get developed a lot in the fourth book because the fourth book is called rhythm of war so that's clearly going to be a very parshendi focused book uh would be my guess um my prediction right now is that ishonai is going to become is going to very quickly migrate from the intermissions to the actual main story and become one of our main point of view characters and that rhythm of war is going to be her book uh like 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 way of kings with kaladins and like this appears to be shalans and i'm guessing the next one the third one is going to be dalinar's because it's called, because it's named after his sword um so that's my prediction right now we'll see if i'm right when i get to rhythm of war um but yeah uh the 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 the, the main reveal here is that i was right when i said at the end of the last book that i don't believe that it's going to turn out that the void bringers are actually the parshendi and i think that's what we're seeing here i think the implication here is that the void bringers are actually the gods of the parshendi that the parshendi themselves are were essentially like a uh, a slave race without free will who were created by the void bringers uh to fight for them but who ultimately rebelled uh so i don't think that the coming storm that's being predicted is the parshendi my guess is that the parshendi are in fact going to 
play a pivotal role in stopping the coming storm. Um, and that makes me really excited because I love stories where different factions who hate each other are all kind of all the good guys. Like, they're, like no, there's no, there, there's like neither of the two major factions are like completely wrong. Uh, or completely right, because I do, like, I do have to say, as much as I like the idea of, of, like, sort of vindicating the Barshendi, I don't buy the idea that killing Gavilar was the only way to go about things. I, I still don't know why they killed him. I still don't know what it was he wanted, but I'm sure some diplomacy maybe could have been attempted before regicide. Um... Just a thought. Uh, but, yeah, I think that's all I have to say about this section. This was a bit chaotic because there's so much going on, and I'm recording this, like, right after I finished reading. That's the difference between uh, recording videos about a book I'm enjoying and recording videos about Alloy of Law, by the way. <laughs> Uh, it took me a week to record that last video. This one I'm recording literally 15 minutes after finishing the last chapter. Because I want to keep reading. Like, right now. I have to. <laughs> so, I'm going to go off and do that. Um, I don't really have any idea what's coming next in this book. Uh, so I'm not even going to make any predictions. Other than the ones I've already made about Shen and Yasna. So... Um, see you next week for, uh, whatever happens next. I don't know yet. I haven't read it. Bye.